Hello, friends. I am your host, Andy Reiner, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the River of Suck podcast, episode 33, featuring the brilliant Christian House. A quick warning to listeners out there, this episode contains a few expletives that were just too funny for me to bleep. It also contains several drug references. If these things will damage your eardrums and or brain, please choose another episode. For the rest of y'all, what Christian has to say is super real, and I know you're going to be inspired. There's even a special musical surprise at the end. Let's listen in. Welcome, friends, to River of Suck podcast episode 33. I've got a very special guest today, Christian Howes. He is an entrepreneur, a musician, a family man, a very solid human, and my friend, my teacher, a mentor. Uh, I can't say enough good things about this guy, so I'm really stoked about this conversation we're going to have. What's up, Chris? Hey, Andy. Thanks for having me. <laughs> is it cool if I call you Chris, or do you want Christian, the old no, no, official? Chris is good. Chris is good. Right. We, we, we get the Christian just out there for people. You know, it's a branding marketing thing. Like right, right. So like ChristianHouse.com is how you Yeah, find exactly. You but, yeah, yeah. you know, but everybody calls me Chris and you're, you know. <laughs> nice. Well, I've been podcasting in your atmosphere for a little bit. Like I've been teaching at your Camp Creative Strings Workshop. Now I know it's morphed a little bit. But uh, I remember trying to ask you to get on this podcast years ago. You were like, no, you should interview Cedric. He'll be sick. I'm too busy running this camp. (laughs) And I was like, so I'm I'm stoked to finally make this happen. And uh, yeah, man, I I wonder if we could start because of that. I just want to dive right into like, what is the river of suck analogy? Just get it out there. And then we'll talk about you the whole rest of the time. So great. (laughs) Here it is. The river of suck is an imaginary river that flows through your mind. You're on one side, your comfort shore. Behind you is your comfort cave. This is where you are now, where you can do all the things you already know how to do. Comfort zone, easy, all good. Way far across in the distance on the other side of this wide, terrifying river of suck is future you who can do all the things you wish you could do now all those goals that you're not there yet but you wish you could be what's your ideal you and the problem is in between your comfort shore and future you is the raging (laughs) white water rapids filled river of suck also filled with rocks also filled with thought piranhas those negative thoughts that just intrusively enter your head without your permission try to sabotage your good vibes you know stuff like (laughs) self-doubt any of the fear and loathing stuff a lot of the self-doubt and these uh thought piranhas really come back to fear they're all sort of like sprout like fear is the seed and it sprouts out to all these different plants and well piranhas fish and plants are different We're in the weeds here on the side anyway. So that's the river of suck. You have to suck at something before you can be good at it. You got to take one swim stroke at a time, one step. You can't just magically appear at your future self that can do all those super impossible seeming things. No, you have to suffer. And if you really love what you're trying to do, you actually have to enjoy the suffering. So that's the theory of the river of suck. So the first question after that is, does that resonate with you? And how do you see that in your life? A thousand percent, Andy, it resonates. And I, I see it in my life in, someone said to me the other day that there's like these, you know, four great teachers or something. And it's like, you know, money, family, relationship, Mm -hmm. you know, or marriage. And, uh, and I, I don't remember what the other one, maybe health or fitness, maybe. And right. then, but I think also like any practice. So like, you know, obviously we, we practice the violin, but we also practice music. 
Yeah. Which are two different things. And you, you know, you practice composition, which is like its own thing versus like improvisation versus like the fiddle versus like, you know. Yeah. So these practices, all of these things show up for me as the river of suck. And I like daily, I circle back and go through a process where I just reflect on where I'm at with like, what do I want? What is on the other side of the river? And, uh, and just trying to constantly come back to it and, and, uh, not, um, retreat from those things or get distracted from those things and constantly reevaluating like what is actually important and what do I think is the, the most perfect sequence to look at those things? Cause like, let's say that, you know, what comes up for me and you right now is like, I want to be able to play my <laughs> diminished scales really fast. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> yeah. but so what's the, what is the right sequence though? That's going to help me do that. Cause maybe if I get actually improve like my parenting, maybe that's the first step that's actually going to help me play diminished scales faster or like, <laughs> like literally or if i like lose 10 lose 10, 10 pounds like which comes first because like i know i want to lose 10 pounds and and you know address my shoulder injury and I, like i know that i want to be closer like in my marriage and in my parenting relationships and i know that i want to make more money and i know that you know i also want to be able to blaze on these diminished scales so <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know and also like teaching and all like i want to be a better teacher yeah. you know or a better writer or like so all these other things and so which one of these things should be coming first which which one how much attention should i put on each one of these things and I, i'm constantly trying to rearticulate what are the things that are that are important to me and what's a goal that i can set that's measurable around yeah. that rather than just this vague idea of i need to be better you know, how can I make it a goal? Like a goal for diminished scales would be like, I can play my diminished scales when the eighth note, you know, playing eighth notes at BPM 120. <laughs> like that's a goal. In context. That's a goal. Yeah. Like that's measurable. Sure. You know, versus I just want to be better at diminished scales. And then what's an action plan to go for that? Well, okay, I'm going to practice 10 minutes a day of this exercise. You know, and I'm going to yeah. record and measure back, for example. But I want to have those same measurable goals um, and action plans in those other domains of my life, whether relationships, family, fitness, health, um, and other things, money. Yeah. Well, you bring up some amazing points there. So, like, looking at yourself as a person, as a whole, whole person, I guess there's a word for that, holistic, right? <laughs> you know, like all of these things don't happen in a vacuum. So the other thing is like, man, being realistic about those goals with yourself. I think if you are realistic about what's possible for you coming up, you're much more likely to attain those goals. I wonder, have you had points in your life where your goals were so unrealistic, you didn't get there and then you felt weird about it? Is that how you arrived at making such good, more realistic goals? Like how did that happen? I think that a lot of times we don't set clear goals. Right. And it sounds pedantic, but I think actually we're, we're afraid to set clear goals. And because, yeah. we're, you know, or for me, I'll speak for myself. I don't want to say we, but, but it's like, <laughs> um, well, I could set a goal of being able to play the, you know, the diminished scale. Um, or let's say like, I'll use a better, maybe an easier analogy. Let's say that my goal is to write 10 songs this yeah. month. So I, well, I could set that goal, but part of me feels like, well, do I really want to set it? Because like, <laughs> you know, cause I'm not sure that I, that I might fail if I don't, you know, I yeah. think if we, if we actually spend more time and, and just stay in that process, then we can set the goal and we don't have to set too many goals. I feel like just picking two or three or four or five, you know, um, <laughs> I mean, there's, I guess there's different domains of life and that's what makes it hard. It's like in, in music, um, I might say like, okay, realistically, I'm going to write five songs this month and try to practice 15 minutes a day or, you know, but I also am going to try to, um, 
run three times a week or do fitness yeah. three times a week or and I'm going to make time with my kids and my wife or you know like in, in sort of like these relationship goals so I think that might be healthier than setting 10 goals for my music yeah. practice and those small intervals of time like 15 minutes really add up and I think a lot of what like I've been r sprinting from gig to gig in the last month and a half and I haven't made enough time to go walk outdoors and it's like when i do it's for 15 minutes and my whole day <laughs> is so much different if i get outside and like check out these wildflowers for like 15 minutes how many people think they should practice more who who, who don't go for 15 minutes because they think they need two hours i mean it sounds like you believe you can make meaningful progress in your life in just 15 minutes as a habit you know and by doing those habits, those are the little steps in the river of suck, I think. Yeah, well, I think even just like with that that phrase you used, like, I need to practice more, right? Like, I feel <laughs> like that for a long time, I, I've had that. And I still get that voice on my shoulder, like, you need to practice more. But actually, I think that part of the reason that doesn't work is because there's not a clear goal associated right, right. with it. And it's like the, you know, if there's a clear goal of like, I want to improve my intonation by totally 50% on this passage in this song, that's so clear. Then there can be like, okay, what's my action plan? Well, for 15 minutes a day, I'm going to work towards that goal and only that goal versus like, I just need to get better and I just suck or whatever. I feel like that's one of the most unhelpful things and that I have definitely <laughs> suffered, you know, like my progress and enjoyment yeah. have suffered. So I'm, I'm big right now on like progress and enjoyment. Yeah. Like so, so like, you know, like, cause, cause I know what part of you're talking about is like, and you said that, like get to the other side, but also enjoy the struggle, so to speak. Totally. Right? That, there's a little contradiction in that, but it's like, sure. I feel like practice we should enjoy practicing. And I remember, it's funny because my teacher, Michael Davis, my classical violin teacher, he said, you know, there's a difference between practicing and playing. You know, if you're playing for enjoyment, that's fine, but don't call it practice. You know, like just if you're playing tunes or whatever, a lot of times, you know, a lot of us, we, you know, we just yeah. kind of, we're playing, we get our fellow, let me just play something. Okay, well, that doesn't, that's not practicing. You just played. <laughs> Which, that's okay. You can play. Like play for enjoyment and play call music. It that. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, and call it that, you know, and like, that's great. Just don't call it, don't conflate it with practice. And if you're practicing, my teacher said, you know, if you're practicing, you don't sound good when you practice. If you sound good, you're not yeah. practicing. Yeah, totally. But mainly, I mean, it's kind of a little bit of an oversimplification. So, um, but I think instead of, but so then that made me, I think for a lot of us, then we associate that with like, okay, practice is hard and practice right. sucks and we don't enjoy practice. But I've been thinking about it recently more about like, no, we should enjoy practice. Yeah. We should really enjoy practice. And um, so a lot of my teaching now is focused on mindfulness and trying to treat practice very much in the same way as like practicing yoga. When you go yeah. into yoga, when you go into yoga class, like you're trying to progress at the stretches and the poses and the forms, right? In the same way that in practicing, we're we're dealing with forms. We're dealing with you know sure. rhythmic forms, harmonic forms, and like you know playing in tune. It's just like yoga, <laughs> but during yoga, you've got a person constantly telling you you're perfect right where you are. Breathe, move your attention to these different things is it constantly giving you these reminders of how you can be more present and more appreciative and more aware and more like self-loving basically and i feel like practicing music it should be that process i want it to be that process for people i want and for myself and for my students and for everybody listening here and and that this should be the priority actually. So what I've been saying for like the last couple of years is that practicing the violin or practicing music, it's just a vehicle for becoming a better friend to yourself. Mm. That's the title of this episode. Become a better friend for yourself. <laughs> yeah. And 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 so 
I mean, that's really the issue. That's the reason that I think for decades I was never happy with my playing. Mm. I was always critic. You know, I always felt like I wasn't enough. I wasn't good enough. I was always like kind of judging myself or beating myself up. And and I would say for the listeners, like I know, like some of like the most virtuosic musicians that I've ever heard, and I consider like quote unquote musical heroes. I know that yeah. some of those people feel like every note they play is utter crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, and I've talked to those people and I've heard stories about those people, like playing the yeah. most mind blowing stuff you can imagine. And then you go talk to them and they're like, I'm crap. I suck. I'm, yeah. you know, my playing is horrible, you know? And then you can find people that just started playing their instrument like six months ago. And they're like, I'm having the best time ever. So, yeah. So there's not a direct line between like our quote unquote skill or ability and like how we feel about ourselves. So what I really want to do is focus more on how can I feel better when I'm when I'm practicing? How can I feel mm -hmm. better about myself? And that's what I want my students to feel. And, and probably, you know, in the past when I was a teacher, I wasn't as aware of this. So I apologize to you, Andy, and to any other <laughs> students for, for whatever. I did not have this in the front of my mind and I, I did not cultivate, you know, uh, a constant appreciation for the student, but I definitely do now. And, and, <laughs> but that's one of the things I've always admired about you, I think, is that you do cultivate, um, excitement, enthusiasm, uh, for, for your practice. And, yeah. and you also, I think you have the ability to, um, to be forgiving of yourself and appreciative of yourself. Trying. And always trying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's just my sense about you, you know, it's just my sense about you that, you know, um, I think you're very self-aware and, and I, and so it's like, it's not that you don't notice quote unquote mistakes or sure. things you would like to improve or whatever, but like, I, I get the sense that you also are a cheerleader for yourself and that there's a voice inside of you that says, I'm going to keep, I'm going to pick myself up and I'm going to keep trying. Yeah. And that there's a, there's like an optimism about you that I think everybody loves frankly i certainly do and i appreciate it and i'm trying to cultivate more of that myself <laughs> and for my students but i think that it, this is an emotional um yeah. practice it's really an emotional practice and mm. and so if anybody goes to yoga or taekwondo or they have some kind of community where there's a, an emotional practice that is cultivated could be church for some people frankly you know yeah. i would say bring that into your other practices whether it's musical practice instrumental practice relationships whatever like bringing cultivating more mindfulness and developing more emotional tools yeah that's what i'm working on currently cool well <laughs> I, I i sure appreciate all that i feel like there's something i need to respond to in there i try to be a person who exudes fun i try to inspire other people to find their best selves but I am far from perfect within the thought piranhas of my own mind. And so one of the biggest reasons that I'm doing this podcast is like, I really like to talk about it, trying to hold it all in and feeling like you're alone in these struggles. That's the most hard thing. So that's the whole idea of the river of suck swim team is that here we are, we're all feeling these weird things. Let's feel them together. And with that idea of community, it seems more attainable to like keep going every day when it seems hard, you know, but I'm still always working on it and all those things. You're like, I apologize to all my, you know, you're good, man. I always thought you were a very inspiring person. So you make me want to pick more specific goals and practice towards things. And yeah, I mean, I played on a gypsy jazz festival as a guest yesterday after hearing Jason Anik go up and play and I'm like, oh, I'm going to go play this thing with Enion and it's going to be like, it's going to be scary because all these people are are like, who can play the most notes? And it's a, it's a jazz festival. So how can I go from playing my morning gig of like literally just like kind of a, a jam session with friends at a coffee shop to like a, a gypsy jazz festival? And what happened was I got on stage and I had fun playing with music with my friends, which is not actually that different from what it did that morning at the coffee shop. It's just like, you know, what's your comfort zone changes the context of how you feel. And all that to say, 
it's hard to be a person. And I appreciate all those things that you've said so far about, you know, looking at the context of, of where that is. So I want to go back in time because you mentioned decades of self-loathing and criticism. <laughs> right. uh, I'll put this very in a very open-ended uh, way. Yeah. I'd love to hear your superhero or- origin story of how you got to be this person that you are now. But I want you to include at least one disaster. Okay. <laughs> There's so many disaster <laughs> stories that I could share. Um, I, maybe I'll start with one of one of the first disaster stories. Was okay. This is a good disaster story. Like like yeah. I was like 16. I started playing electric bass with a friend of mine who was a songwriter. His name is Mike Hollenbeck, and yeah. uh, he. Uh, I had been a classical violinist since I was five. But I had only recently started integrating with some of my friends who played in rock bands. And actually playing in rock bands or with singer-songwriters at that time was like a completely, completely foreign world to me. Yeah. Different rules, different reality. And I thought that I was like, that I knew everything. Because I was like the Suzuki violin player playing Paganini and all that stuff. And um, and I went over to Mike's house and, and he was showing me this song. And it was like, I think I even have a guitar. It was like he played like an A chord. Yeah. And then the next chord was a D7. And I was like, you can't do that. Because <laughs> because 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 you're in the key of A. You can't go to D7. That is a C natural. Which is a ridiculous statement, right? But but at the time at the time I thought that like and he said and he said I just did it. I just did. What do you mean yeah. I can't do it? I did it. Yeah. He was like, this is, you know, he was like, which was completely appropriate. Yeah. You know, it's my song. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's not really like a huge disaster, but, uh, but it was, yeah, it was, it was like, there was a lot of experiences like that. Um, where, uh, I was, maybe I was like, I was a little, I was kind of arrogant, I guess when I was young. Sure. And, uh, and, uh, and I got checked or like, I just embarrassed myself, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. There were, there were a lot of other experiences though, like where, um, as a violinist, I was trying to enter into different spaces or communities of musicians, whether it was jazz, whether it was, um, rock music, um, other music and either I was excluded or laughed at uh, often a lot on my own gigs with people that I hired would be laughing at me on stage behind my Whoa. back or giving each other like sideways glances like this guy doesn't know what he's doing, you know, and I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, you know, I, and um, yeah, or like go to jam sessions and like just wait and people just don't invite me up, you know, just, just like, you know, they're obviously <laughs> excluding me, you know, giving me excuses. Um, a lot of stuff like that happened to me in, you know, in my kind of journey of like trying to exist as a violin player in other communities outside of classical music where I didn't really know the mm -hmm. rules. I didn't know a lot of skills as a musician, you know, I was kind of trying to figure them out. Yeah. One of those checks. I don't know. When I think of you and I think of a superhero origin story, I'm just missing one thing, which is just that the legal system checked you, did it not? And then that's how you learn jazz. Is that right? Like as a from a classical musician, you came out of this uh system and all of a sudden you were like a jazz superhero. Yeah, I mean well <laughs> Yeah, I mean that yeah, I mean that's a big disaster story. Yeah. I mean basically when I was uh you know 18 19 i was in college and i was playing in the bars at night even though i was studying music in the music school at ohio state university mm -hmm. but i was playing bass in like i guess what people could say is like the offshoot of like kind of like the grateful dead like social music scene so when i was at the music school doing classical playing an orchestra every day or whatever at ohio state at night, I was going out at Ohio State, um, the bar scene, and I was playing bass in yeah. like 
a rock band, which was basically associated with that scene. And so people on that scene, basically, they drank, they smoked weed, and they did some psychedelics, either mushrooms or LSD from time to time. And I was, you know, 18. And so, um, but because I played in the band, then I, you know, the like drug dealer who would service, who would bring around the weed or the <laughs> mushrooms, he came up to me and he was like, hey, you know, do you want some of this stuff? And then, so I had easy access because I played in the band. And then I have friends that were like, can you get my uncle, you know, a few hundred hits of L LSD? And I was like, I don't know. I'll make a phone call to this guy. And I did. And then, you know, and so then I got sent to jail. Yeah. Mm. And uh, and that was like the big disaster, you know. <laughs> um, and yeah, yeah. So, so I went so I went to jail for four years when I was twenty in Ohio, and yeah, I played four music four years. Yeah, and I played music in prison. Yeah, and I learned from a lot of um, people in prisoners in prison men. I learned from a lot of men and I learned like, you know, West, West Montgomery licks, like sitting on a prison yard, you know, with this, this older guy named Ali who played like a, a guitar, just like the guitar I was just holding. And, uh, I had a guitar sometimes and sometimes I had a violin or whatever. And I would sit there on the yard and I would learn, you know, and, and other, other wow. um, musicians, um, and we had cassette tapes back then. So some, occasionally I would get a cassette tape and I could transcribe stuff or I'd go to solitary confinement. And I'd sit and I'd write things on <laughs> staff paper and I'd sing like <laughs> exercises. Like it was crazy, you know? Um, but that was a, yeah, it was a huge disaster. And uh, I guess it's like my, if you want to call it my superhero origin story, it's definitely a big part of, it definitely informs a big part of um, everything about me today. Um, yeah. my, you know, my, me as a musician, me as a teacher, me as an organizer, entrepreneur, um, my values, like everything about me, you know, ha has been informed by the four years I spent in prison and, you know, and I don't necessarily share it with everybody, but you know, I, I, and I used to share it more, but I've, I've share it less nowadays, sure. but I feel really comfortable sharing it with you. Um, and, uh because we're close, you know, and we're, we have a, we have a really, really solid friendship and, and I feel comfortable sharing it with your listeners. Cause I know that it's a community that's connected to you and, and <laughs> yeah. so I can speak, I think I can speak honestly about it in this format in a way where <clears throat> in the past it would be traumatizing to me to talk mm. about it. Oh, okay. Yeah. From my perspective, looking at you as a mentor, but also a friend, what I see you've turned this into is like a humbling experience that really focuses how important time is to you and, and has forced you to consider what are your priorities. And you're still asking those questions, but you know, now you're, <laughs> you're married, you have kids and like you're teaching, you have a business you know, it seems like life is pretty good, right? It's certainly better. It's it's improved. You you're on a continually improving thing, and I've just I can't imagine it's never happened to me. But it seems to me like that's the ultimate humbling experience, right? It well, I mean, I I think that probably everybody has humbling experiences, right? And um, you know. I, I, I know it's like kind of maybe for some people it feels it's less familiar. It's more like exotic, but I think like people have, everybody can have hard experiences that are deeply humbling for them. Yeah. And so, um, but I would say that it's interesting, like your take on it, which, which I appreciate <laughs> saying that like I developed a sense for time, but I would say that I, I, I would explain it differently. Mm. I would, I would say that, and I think what you're referring to is like the fact that like from the time I was young or when I got out of prison, when I was 24 anyway, that I, I hustled and yeah. I mean, I hustled and like, so people that know me from even <laughs> eight years later, like when you met me, when I was at Berkeley, yeah. you know, me as like a very like hustling person, you know, it's not necessarily because of like a sense of time. I think that the reason that I became so 
hustle oriented was because I had like a fear that the world would crumble around me. Mm. And I think that because when I was in prison, that was a very real reality every day. Wow. It was, you know, cause I was, I was serving six to 25 year sentence, which is an indeterminate sentence, which means that you could stay there for 25 years. And also just because of the nature of being in jail, mm. like anything can happen. Any yeah. day. Like really anything can happen. Like, I mean, really, <laughs> yeah. it, I mean, like, it's like, it's not just if somebody does something to you, like you have, what if you do something to that? Cause the way it works is like, you're constantly confronted by like threats and, you know, challenges. And then, <clears throat> so if you, if you don't respond to a challenge, then that there's a consequence, potential consequence for that. If sure. You do respond to a challenge. There's a potential consequence to that. So you're always in a rock and a hard place and you feel really, you know, and the thing is like, well, if you get in trouble while you're in there, then you've got that 25 on the end, right? It's like, if you get in trouble, they can just hold you longer. It's in the, it's not known. You're serving, I was serving six to 25. Damn. I didn't know what I was going to get, yeah. you know? And it's like, but not only could they keep me for 25, but I'm like, well, if the wrong thing happens, I might hurt somebody. Yeah. Then you're stuck. Then just, that could be stuff forever. forever. So, so that's like a real, like, you know, thing of just like, I, I mean, and I'm kind of trying to reconstruct and, but it, it became like a hyper vigilant state all the time of like, there's, you know, just always feeling like super high stakes. Yeah. And just like, what's going to happen today? Like, am I going to get through this day? And then, so when I got out, I think that I was like, that was still in me. That fear right. was still in me. And, and I think that I was like, I'm going to push as hard as I can to create distance from that so that I never have to go back to that. So that there's never a risk that I will go back. And it's not yeah. even rational. It's not even just like about like, okay, I'm not going to do another crime or something. It's just like this feeling of like, you know, so everything else became infused with that, like, hyper urgency and uh, sensitivity. And it was like, you know, I can't go broke. I can't go into debt. I need to make money. And just like everything that I was pursuing became, it took that on. Like, if I like, it, and, you know, I was like, I'm going to have a career as a jazz violinist. You know, I'm going to, you know, get gigs. There was all a part, I think it was all part of that. It was there was an emotional component of like if I don't do this I'm gonna fail but failure I associated with like really high stakes emotionally. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and fear is just a driving force. And you know, I started this podcast. I didn't think I was afraid of things, and and in piecing apart what are these thought piranhas, you know, Sarah Gorak she coined that phrase. Uh, oh yeah. So like piecing that all together, I realized that I was more afraid of things than I had noticed. But when we're kind of reacting to fear without recognizing it for what it is, I think that leads us in a different direction than a more conscious um, journey of like, hmm. well, this is this is this is part of what I'm afraid of, and I'm going to recognize that fear and then move forward. <laughs> We we because you can't you can't get rid of it. That's the thing. Everyone wants to just like oh be fearless, go about your life and be yourself. Be fearless. Like being fearless means you've repressed all of those fears that are very real. Right. I agree. I agree. And yeah. And I've been learning a lot from Evan Greger, um, the last couple of years, and he's been you know working with people in my music business mastermind and then like coaching like and it goes out from there not just for people who are applying it to like money and career but also like how fears manifest in our music and relationships and all, all kinds of ways and he what you just said it it resonates because one of the things he talks about is like really not trying to power through yeah but actually recognize the thing that you feel and 
kind of owning it and being like trying to have like a uh, a dialogue an inner dialogue with that voice that fearful voice inside of us yeah and so recognizing it and yeah i mean he's like certified and like a genius at doing it so i don't want to misrepresent <laughs> it but like like what do you what are you feeling and experiencing with that you know he says that but what are yeah. you feeling you can speak it to your mind yeah like <laughs> so yeah so the way i've been trying to bring it in is like around just yeah just noticing my emotions and actually giving them more um not trying to say like oh i'm just going to power through that or um i'm weak for feeling that or you know or trying to rationalize or strategize through it because you know i'm big on strategy like i like yeah. i help people with i'll just back pedal a little bit like if people sure. are like i want to be a better musician i'm like i can help you with that we're going to figure out your vision your goals and your action plan and then you're going to get feedback and community and accountability and then that's how it's going to fix it right but you can do all of these elements you can do all these elements but then still somebody will feel paralyzed from moving forward they'll procrastinate they'll distract themselves mm. they'll there'll be things that just happen and there's like there's no way they could practice right or there's no way that <laughs> they can push they can push send on like a sales email or it's like it's like even if you give everybody yeah. the right sequence the right method the right strategy like the feedback the accountability the support they're still at some like and all those things i think are really important and like what we were talking what we were talking about earlier is like you know let me let me reflect on my vision let me reflect on my goals let me reflect yeah. on my action but you can do all those things but you can still <laughs> feel like that taking the next step is the equivalent of touching a hot stove of putting your hand in a blazing fire right that at that point it's a physiological response mm. and at yeah. that point you need emotional tools not rational tools right <clears throat> and uh now of course we can get those emotional tools from getting support from people like evan you know like a therapist like um a meditation or you know maybe going to yoga like all these things combined but it really has to be like let me put energy into these emotional tools yeah and so to your point yeah that's what i've been working on is like emotional regulating regulating my emotions <laughs> and it starts with like noticing like uh oh my wife said something and i feel triggered like For i hate sure. to use that word but like actually like yeah so, but we don't want to take the word trigger out of context because i know it gets yeah. it gets overused and it also maybe gets conflated with bad things but i think to notice that like I feel triggered is actually a healthy thing. Yeah. And to be, because then I can say, okay, why do I feel triggered? Like, what is the feeling that I'm feeling? Let me sit with that. Let me kind of have a dialogue with myself. Like, why am I, what am I feeling? First of all, oh, I'm feeling upset. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, can I go deeper into that? Oh, I'm feeling afraid that my wife's mad at me. Right? For example, right? Totally hypothetical, by the way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then it's like, <laughs> yeah. well, well, do I feel afraid about that? Like, do I feel like whatever? And really starting a process of of inquiry, of dialogue, and not trying to power through it, not trying to ignore it, but trying to deal with it. Maybe I need to call my mom and be like mom what advice will yeah. you give me right now um about this and maybe she'll help me reflect on it or maybe i call a therapist and i ask the therapist about it but uh um yeah it's been a few years that i've been trying to yeah. to work on these things so that and my goal is to be more emotionally regulated to not be in a state of like anxiety anger whatever fight or flight those kinds of things and just recognizing it better yeah wow that's all super real thanks for sharing that i i uh i've been thinking recently just about the fact that you really can only do one thing at a time and so trying to do everything all the time i have found doesn't work 
and <laughs> in order to move forward in anything, just noticing that I literally can only do one thing at a time. So I have to pick what that thing is that I'm going to do next <laughs> and like put that one next foot forward. And if I put this left foot forward, that means that the next thing that's going to happen is my right foot goes forward and moving forward in that way seems more possible than trying to like look up the whole time and be like, Oh my gosh, I'm so far away. <laughs> right. Seeing that distance as overwhelming is overwhelming, but, but just taking that next step brings you to that next place. So that's, that's how I'm trying to get there. Cause I'm, I'm also, like I said before, I don't have it all together. That's the point of this podcast. These conversations are so important to me. Well, what comes up for me when I hear you talk about that is, is something that you didn't say, but that I'm reading mm. into it, which is that sure. when we're trying to accomplish a lot of things, we can feel completely overwhelmed and yeah. defeated and scattered yes. and procrastinate on all of them and then beat ourselves up. It can be like this whole like massive, yeah. like, you know, just this <laughs> onslaught of it. It's like two weeks and all I've done is got up every day and felt like, what am I going to do? I'm going to try this. And I didn't fall through on anything. And I just felt bad at the end. And I'm like, okay, let me drink a couple shots of whiskey at the end of the night because I don't want to deal with this. So it's like, and then we don't make any progress. Yeah. <laughs> And then we feel more mad at ourselves, and then it continues, <laughs> right? That is the cycle. <laughs> the, su the suck cycle. Yeah, the overwhelm and then beating ourselves up and then, you know, exactly. And so, you know, how do we pull ourselves out of it? Yeah, I, where does it start? You know, I again, I would say, I would invite all the listeners here to, like, sit down with a pencil, and you could even do it right now, and just write down, okay, what is my vision? And then... Give yourself some space on the paper and then write down what are my goals that are aligned mm. with my vision and then write down what are my action plans. <clears throat> and uh, and then you, you might have a few different domains that you apply this to. So your vision in, you know, violin. Yeah. Music practice or like harmony, you know, <laughs> like your vision <laughs> in your relationships, social life, like love life, whatever, you know, fitness, money, you can have any of those domains can apply. Um, but I think the vision could be all encompassing of all these things. And what you can think about with that vision statement, I want to give you a couple things to, to make it a little more specific. Cool. One is what do you want to receive as a part of your vision? And what do you want to contribute as part of your vision? Because I find that many people are mm. disconnected from one or the other. Like a lot of teachers, I find, yeah. when when you ask them or, you know, what's your vision? And they're like, I want to make a difference. I want to help these people. I want to contribute here. I want to, But they never include anything that's about what they want to receive. Now, that's a disconnect, I would guess. So you, you need to answer both sides. And I would say when I was younger... Like I was the opposite. I was just like, I want to receive, I want to be famous. I want to make a lot of money. You know, I want, I want, you know, <laughs> I want girlfriends, you know? And, and it was like, you know, um, that was all in the reception side, but I wasn't really thinking of, I wasn't able to tap into how can I contribute? What can I, how, what's the impact I can make? So for your vision, what do you want to receive? What do you want to contribute? What do you mm. want to feel? What do you want your life to look like with whom? So, try to spend some time answering those things um, on the vision side. And then on the goal side, try to write down one to three goals that um, really align with that vision in any domains that matter to you. And then from there, you can start to derive action plans and start to kind of prioritize and see where some of these things can dovetail. So like, for example, if I'm like, well, I really want to have... Um, more quality time with my son, let's yeah. say, for example. And I also want to run three times or do exercise three times a week. I could be like, okay, I'm going to exercise with my son. Like, the, let's make that happen because that's a way to integrate, synergize, be efficient, you know, whatever, you know, stuff like that. I love that. I, I think the idea of, of writing it down makes it feel more real to me. I've only recently realized I'm a very visually oriented person. So the act of seeing the words of those thoughts and goals for me makes a big difference 
than just trying to keep it all in my head and trying to remember what I'm supposed to be remembering. Like writing it down makes it feel real in a different way for me. So thank you for sharing that process. It's awesome. Yeah, I've heard people say that like, you know, using a pencil or a pen and writing it on paper, it can have like, I don't know, connect to your brain or whatever, like more than maybe typing. Yeah. But I, I don't quote me on that. But I do think, <laughs> but I would say for, for a lot of us that we get so overwhelmed, uh, as you were, you know, referencing for yourself with the multitasking or doing all the yeah. things, it's like, did actually, we don't even give ourselves permission to take 20 minutes and do this because we're like, no, I got stuff to do. I got, I can't afford to sit down and do it. But for right. me, this becomes like this th- for people that are struggling, I would say, I would say this is the f- most important thing for you to be doing every day. And right on. And, and because otherwise we're just taking actions, but we don't, we don't have a goal. We don't have a vision, and so we're just do, we're just like I need to practice thirty thousand key signatures and scales and compose this, and, and I need to play faster, and I need to be, you know, more in tune. And and then somebody told me that I need to work on these like hemiolas, like for fiddle tunes. And then what about old time Boeings? I need to work on old time Boeings. Why can't I play like Bruce Molsky yet? Oh my God! Yeah, you know, yeah. and it's like those are so many things, like you know, and then it's that's it's the cycle. <laughs> So, so we have to go through the, and I know what I was going to say is like, then take that paper and then like go to somebody that is like, that you trust yeah. and be like, can I get your feedback? Like what comes up for you? And like, don't abuse it, but I mean, like use it though. If you got people that you can get feedback from that are in your life, do that. Um, now again, like this may not cover everything, but I, I would say that this is where it all needs to start. And the only thing that's going to be left is bringing, you know, a lot of these emotional tools to bear, like I said, as well. So like developing some emotional practice that, um, where you can self self regulate, um, where you can start to get some of that, uh, those fight or flight, like habits out or whatever, I guess people call this, different things. I don't have all the, like the best terminology. I'm not like certified in anything, but I think that's, I think it's really important that those things, if you do those two things, I feel like maybe you'll play faster. <laughs> if that's what yeah. you want to do, you want to play faster or like you'll make more money. Like I would almost guarantee it that you will. Being a friend to yourself. <laughs> yeah, man. And you'll well, enjoy I'll, it. Yeah. And you'll enjoy yeah. it more. <laughs> You know, because, because, you know, it's like, I know like Andy, like you run like a haunted house business and like, you know, yeah. you know, and you run fiddle hell, like the biggest, like fiddle community, like events in the whole <laughs> world. And you're like the most prolific composer I know. And you've got f- seven bands, probably still at least. And, yeah. uh, you know, you're gigging and, you know, you're married and like, you know, you do all these amazing things and that's only like half the stuff. Plus you're, you teach a lot, you put out courses, you put out cool stuff. And, um, so I'm sure you're like aware of like the feeling of like waking up in the morning and just like, just be like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. yeah <man. laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it's just like the first thing is just like, totally. oh man, I got to do fucking 300 things a day. Fuck. Yeah. You know, it's like you just <laughs> jump out of bed and you're like, you know, you you haven't even like breathed yet or brushed your teeth and you're just like freaking out, right? And then you go through the day with this just like this massive amount of tension <laughs> in your body and in your psyche. And it's like, wouldn't it be so much better to just feel peaceful while doing those things? So that's, that's my thought. I'm trying. Well, I feel fear and I feel peace and uh, they're all jumbled up together and i'm (laughs) trying to sort them out every day (laughs) yeah man well i know we're we're above our time limit i really appreciate you spending the time to talk to me and talk to the river of suck swim team and all the listeners out there because everyone is struggling with these things everyone is waking up and saying these things and trying to figure out it is hard to be a person man but i love your perspective and uh yeah, I can't thank you enough for sharing it. I want to also share where people can find more about you. What are you doing? Where should we follow you? What's going on? 
Well, just go to my website, ChristianHouse.com, H-O-W-E-S. Uh, but mm -hmm. um, the, a lot of free resources I would love people to check out, which is especially the thing I'm excited about over the last few years is my play-along yeah. videos. Play-along videos. And, and I'll actually, for, you know, it's like I've got a, do I have a loop here? Let's see here. Yeah. Um, you want to play something for us? Yeah, I'm going to try. Let's see. Boom. So this is like, a, I'll give you a little bit of an example of a play long video. Yeah. So I play a phrase. And then you play the phrase back to me. Boom, bing, boom. And it's like that. It's like, I, and I have hundreds of these, but in different styles and for different ability levels, uh, different grooves and all that stuff. So, um. They're free. There's hundreds of them on my YouTube channel. If you go to my website, you can find them. I've got a newsletter, podcast, Creative Strings podcast, blogs, and uh, and lots of courses and ways you can work from, with me. And new students can actually take a, f a free lesson with me. Any new student can take a free private lesson with me uh, if you sign up for a trial with my Creative Strings Academy. And I think we have like a $7 offer. So, yeah, thanks, man. You know, I appreciate you so much, Andy, and I appreciate the people in our community uh, that are a part of the River of Suck swim team very much. You all know who you are. And uh, <laughs> yeah, man, you're you're the best, Andy. Thanks for having me on. Heck yeah, Chris. I know it feels like we're done, but do you want to take us out with a little music? Yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> why not? Yeah, you know I'm down with that. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I'll just go where I was at. <laughs> I've asked many guests a lot of similar questions, and the variety of answers keeps me coming back to keep this conversation going. If these insights have had a positive impact on your life or your music, please consider supporting this podcast at riverofsuckswimteam.com. We'll be back soon with more episodes, so make sure you subscribe wherever you listen and follow River of Suck Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. This is all for love and for you, so thank you for listening. Till next time, keep swimming.